Okay. Okay, so we're on. All right, as Dr. Wade said, my name is Doug Kirk. I'm originally from uh, Parkersburg, and uh, I live in Winfield now. And I work in Charleston in the central office in the hydraulics and drainage unit. And I uh, had a variety of experience, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. So how many of you guys are graduating uh, in two months, six weeks? I mean, you're probably counting the days. One. Okay, so you guys have a little more time. Okay, so there's a few other things in here we'll talk about for the undergrads. Uh, this is a hydraulics class, right? How many of you think you might want to do some sort of hydraulics when you're done? Several. Okay, well, good. So we'll have some opportunities, hopefully, for you next year to do that. Um, probably the core does a little bit of that as well. So civil engineers, we get to go many places and work on different things. Uh, the upper left there, I didn't build the airplane. I helped build the hangar. Uh, let's see. On the right is a bridge I did surveying for and cut down uh, rhododendron with a brush axe so that we could get enough surface to, to set the piers for that bridge. Uh, Mount Fuji, uh, I got to climb that one time. And then how many have heard of Knob Noster, Missouri? Yeah, OK, you have. You've probably seen this before. Uh, so it's a small town in the middle of Missouri where the B-2 is uh, stationed. And so those are different places I was, I've been. Um, we get to, to uh, build, supervise, design, maintain, take care of a lot of different things. All civil works, you know, everything you can think of that helps people stay out of the elements and uh, get from one place to the next, a civil engineer has their hands on it. Uh, clean water is part of what we do. So you can see several things there. Uh, in the lower uh, right, lower left, sorry, uh, you see a baseball field. And once you guys have kids, you'll get stuck there. You'll be the one that knows how to square up the field because you'll remember your uh, three, four, five triangles. So even that stuff, you can use your school skills. So a couple different paths. It seems like most people start out, you know, in college, it's all math and science. Math. How many of you guys had a higher English score on your ACT than your math and science? A few of you. Okay, so you guys might tend toward this sooner than others. Uh, mine was like half. Um, so I was, I stayed in the technical side, uh, even though I'm, now I write more than I do math. But uh, eventually, you'll progress to the point where you'll find yourself doing more talking and writing than you will math and science. Um, but mostly you'll start out on the technical side and it'll be up to you. You can kind of choose your path or sometimes the path chooses you just depending on how your supervisors see you progressing and what opportunities happen to be available. So some of these projects that we work on are really exciting. You can see the New River Gorge Bridge and then uh, I think that, that bridge is in Huntington. Uh, the East Huntington Bridge or 6th Street Bridge, I don't know what you call it. 31st Street, okay. Some are interesting. Uh, the upper left there, that bridge, you know, what holds up the end of a bridge? What's that thing called? Abutment, right. So if you look here, you can see that uh, here's basically the end of the beam and here's the abutment and you've got this little flimsy channel connecting the two. Uh, so that was kind of peculiar because the abutments really weren't holding up much. They were just kind of standing there. And on the lower right there, um, took this picture standing in a 10 by 10 box culvert looking downstream through a 60 inch pipe into a 48 inch pipe. And I'm not sure what that black thing running down and through there was, but I didn't dare walk much further because I was stepping in uh, untreated sewage. So uh, different, uh, different things you run into. Enjoy the gray outdoors. Uh, this is, I think, Chestnut Run up in Fayette County above the New River Gorge. So you get to, you know, kind of see wildlife a little bit. Uh, Division of Highways is where I work, so we'll talk a little bit about highways. Uh, 38,000 miles of public roads, almost 7,000 bridges, and we're broken down into a central office and then 10 different districts. And the central office has entry-level jobs in planning and design, construction, and I think maintenance hires a few uh, straight out of college as well. The districts will have similar positions, but their work is typically uh, shorter deadlines, more political pressure, a little less analysis, and it's just a different style of working. You know, if you see yourself as more analytical, uh, you probably want to tend toward the central office, but if you see you're kind of 
seat of the pants, you know, get this done tomorrow because they're building it in the morning, you know, that, then the district might uh, suit you better. Uh, you can see the locations listed there. And I started in, in hydraulics, or not in hydraulics, I started in roadway. And uh, that was interesting. You got to do project management work and kind of coordinate with everything else. All the projects go through the roadway project manager. So you work with the structures people and the right-of-way people and uh, utilities and everything to, to try to get it organized and get the plans drawn and out the door. And then I went to consultant services. My job there was to uh, work with consultants that we were hiring and make sure that they're paperwork was up to speed and negotiate with them to figure out how many millions of dollars we're going to pay them to design stuff. And that was interesting. Got to make a lot of professional contacts there. Uh, I wouldn't say I hated every minute of it, but uh, I couldn't get out fast enough. And I ended up in structures when I came out uh, three years there. And this was more, you know, hardcore math and science. And, and uh, that, was, that was kind of fun, but tedious. Uh, you know, the roadway people always gripe because why do you guys take so long to design a bridge? Well, you know, you see the, the detail that's required uh, for the bridge. It's more than, than the roadway and more than hydraulics. So that's why it takes so long. But that's really where I kind of got started into hydraulics and kind of enjoyed it. And we reached a point where Federal Highways forced us to uh, open up a hydraulics unit. And my bosses saw fit to put me there. And that's where I've been the last 15 years. And that's really kind of been my niche. Um, you know, opportunities to work outside and think outside the box. Don't really have uh, other people in the highway department that I can call that are their foremost experts. And, and keep in mind, I, I was the state hydraulics engineer with just a few years' experience. And, uh, you know, the consultants would say, where did you get your master's degree from? I was like, I don't have one. How many years? Uh, six months? <laughs> well, okay. But, you know, the creative thought kind of got me through those early years and then after a while getting some experience and getting some credibility in there. We work on everything from bridges, culverts, ditches, natural stream design, stormwater management, uh, dabble a little bit in environmental permitting. If you've ever heard of 404 permits, we kind of exercised ourselves a little bit from that process. But they still come to us this morning. I was talking to them about uh, the new uh, nationwide permits that are coming out very soon to try to work with the resource agencies and negotiate, you know, how big does a culvert need to be to cross the stream. So I've worked in all 55 counties, which you can see the map here. Uh, most of you guys probably had uh, West Virginia studies in uh, eighth grade, so you, you know all these counties, right? Or some of you probably learned them in alphabetical, who learned them in alphabetical order? Nobody. I, I was visual. I learned them by the map. So uh, complicated projects to, uh, this is, happens to be the longest bridge in the state, uh, the Blennerhassett Bridge over the Ohio River near Parkersburg. And, uh, you know, different things anywhere from the interstate to uh, bike paths. And sometimes they even let us scout the bike path on our bike, which is fun. And there's office work and field work. Most of the time you end up doing some of both. Uh, I would say I'm probably in the field three times a month is probably about right. If you're in construction, uh, the field is your office. So different uh, functional areas that you can work in, you know, you're a civil engineer, right? So, but that's a, a broad thing and it encompasses a lot of things. So for us in design, you can be doing roadway structures geotechnical, hydraulics, and then some other divisions, uh, construction, uh, babysitting contractors. Maintenance is trying to make sure that we take care of uh, the resources we already have. I mentioned we have 38,000 miles of, of roads. So that's an important job to take care of all that stuff. Uh, planning is kind of long range looking at the big picture. And uh, I don't know, my personal opinion there is you kind of need some, uh, I mean, they need some entry-level guys in that, but for the most part, it's kind of big picture and you need a lot of experience really, I think, to work effectively in planning, but others may have a different opinion. Traffic is kind of interesting. I had a brother that worked in traffic and uh, I'm proud to say he did not design this roundabout and probably Dr. Nichols didn't either. Uh, you can see here the right-of-way 
if you can see how the traffic pattern is set up, uh, when you have a roundabout, who should have the right of way? The people going into the circle or the people trying to get out? Yeah, well, here it looks like it's the people trying to get in. So the buses are blocking all the exits. So if you ever design a roundabout, make sure that the people coming, going out have the right of way. All right, so a little bit more about functional areas. If you're in designing, planning, traffic, you're going to be doing some calculations. You'll have opportunities for creativity. A lot of uh, computer-aided drafting and design work. Uh, construction and maintenance, it's more about coordinating with other people, dealing with concrete, not only physical concrete, but, you know, solid things you can put your hands on. And a lot of common sense, you know, a little less uh, analysis. But if you end up there, don't be afraid to, uh, to whip out your, your skills that Dr. Waite has taught you and uh, put them to work. Uh, central office, so you can see the capital there. That used to be my view. Uh, from my office in the Capitol until they moved us down the street. And uh, here's District 5. How many have been to Burlington, West Virginia? The first time I went there, I went right by it. And, uh, if I'm going uphill, I've passed it. And so that's uh, the Eastern Panhandle in Mineral County. So now they've moved us down to the ballpark. So when we first went, we were kind of grumpy about it. But uh, we're happy about it now. I was looking yesterday to see when the day games are so we can uh, skip across the street and go uh, watch the baseball game. So, co-ops, how many of you guys still have time left in college? Let's see. I guess if you're a sophomore, any sophomores in here? If you're a senior, you're not worried about co-oping. If you're a junior, you've already missed the deadline. So, this is really only applicable to people that are not here. So, to start your uh, work, uh, are any of you guys on DOH scholarship? No. Okay. Well, we have opportunities, and it's pretty easy. All the people that I have had apply, you know, they come to me and say, hey, will you fill out a letter for me, and I'll write it. And uh, they've all been accepted into that program. Uh, so it, it's so far pretty easy to get into, and uh, it'll help pay for your college while you're there. And as long as you don't really cheese off the people that you work for as a co-op, uh, then you'll automatically have a job. Uh, so this is really the important thing now, I guess, for you guys. Looking ahead, uh, if you're graduating this year, now's the time to apply uh, and then be making contacts. You know, if you have co-op experience, contact those people and, you know, get job leads from them. Typically, now the uh, Highway Engineer Trainee Register is open all the time, so you can apply anytime. But, you know, put as much information into your application as possible because know that it's going to be graded by people that are not engineers. So uh, it may be like the federal application where you just, you know, lots of verbiage, lots of verbiage, and you know, more words get you more points. I don't know, but, you know, put down everything that you think is relevant and some things that may not be. You know, work experience is good. But you can't, you know, just send me a resume. It has to go through our Division of Personnel. Go to uh, West Virginia Division of Personnel and apply as a highway engineer trainee. There is also an engineer trainee, which is not what we hire. So if you get on the engineer trainee register, you're likely to get a call from uh, Environmental Protection. And I'm not sure who else hires civil engineers other than them. Um, but the highway engineer trainee register is the one you, you want to get on. And it's all online now. You don't have this big paper form that, that I filled out when I came. And uh, if you have questions with that, you can contact the DOP. If, if you have technical questions about things, uh, feel free to call me, and I'll try to help guide you through it. Uh, as a hydraulics unit leader, it's not I'm not really the personnel guy, but I reached a point where I felt like I needed to get involved because it wasn't really happening to my satisfaction. So um, I'm happy to talk to you guys anytime that you have questions about um, coming to work at highways. And, you know, my bias is toward the central office, toward the engineering division, and of course toward my unit because I need two people. But uh, know that if, if you decide you want to work in a district somewhere, you want to go to Parkersburg, you want to go to Moundsville, I'll be glad to, to help you in any way I can there, too. I know folks up there, and, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to help you. 
Oh, starting pay is about $40,000 a year. Uh, overtime is generally still authorized even though we're in a budget crunch. There's more work than I can get done. And so, uh, you know, if you want to work a few more hours, we will be glad to pay you for that. And starting out, it is time and a half. So, you know, when, when you go to a consultant and they tell you, well, we'll pay you 50 and you'll work 60 hours a week and it's all salary, eh, you know, you got to look at those checks and balances. And uh, time off, one of the great things I have is lots of vacation time and sick leave, which may or may not be available. Uh, I'm sure it won't be available to the extent that we have it. And uh, I think we get 12 or 14 holidays, depending on the year. I think the, the least is 12 and the most is 17. just depends on how Christmas and election days hit. So uh, depending on, you know, do you want to live to work or do you want to work to live, that would be a balance that you would look at there as far as whether you want to work for a consultant or you want to work for uh, the government. Can I make one comment? Please. I've got a graduate student in my, one of my classes this semester who's working at a consultant. And he told me that over the last three weeks he's built 200 hours. Yeah. That's what he told me. Yeah. And I'm When I was in North Carolina, uh, I worked like that for a consultant. And after, uh, like two years after I worked there, I got a, uh, a W-2 from them for the year after. And so I called them up and I said, hey, I got this W-2. What is this for? I said, well, we got audited for the last few months that you worked for us, and uh, we were supposed to be paying you overtime. I said, oh, that's great. So I got the W-2. Where's my check for the money? <laughs> and they said, well, uh, the W-2 comes out of the local office where you worked in Asheville, and the, uh, the checks come out of the central office, so you need to call them and give them your address. I said, well, here's my next question. This, this only covers the last three months that I worked for you guys. What happened to the first uh, year and a half? Oh, well, we weren't audited for that time. So. I think for the most part, most of our consultants do pay time and a half because, honestly, it's cheaper to pay you time and a half than to pay straight time plus benefits. So I think, especially for entry level, you'll, you'll find that they'll be fair with you more than they used to be. But anyway, kind of a one last jab at, at my former employer. Um, openings that we have right now, this is in the engineering division, uh, in-house design section. And in engineering, this is where we start young engineers. And so we got two openings in hydraulics, two, at least two in structures, and at least one in roadway. And I guess that means a lot. Those names mean things to me, but it may not mean much to you guys. So hydraulics, as I already told you, we're going to do bridges. Uh, we're going to look at the hydraulics. We're going to run HECRAS. We're going to run WMS uh, that Dr. Waite has probably taught you guys as he taught us. And uh, you know, a bunch of different culvert analysis and things like that, ditch design, storm water management. Uh, structures, they're going to be charged with all the structural aspects of the bridge from the abutments, to the piers, to the beams, to the splice, the deck design, the parapets, all that stuff. And, and roadway is going to be the project manager, and they're going to do the geometry. So they get to run inroads and make sure that the curves aren't too sharp and the super elevation is right and that the lane widths are correct and that all the utilities get moved in the right place and uh, that we don't uh, run over any flying squirrels or, or any small whirled pagonias or anything like that. And I guess I would say structures is the most analytical. Uh, roadway is the most people-oriented in that you're the project manager. You're going to coordinate with more people. And hydraulics, uh, you know, I like to play in the creek. And uh, I'm more comfortable working on the left side of the decimal place. All right, so here's a couple things to think about. How many of you have already taken the Fundamentals of Engineering exam? Okay, just the senior. Okay, so you guys probably aren't there yet, but take that test as soon as you can. Uh, I know it's changed uh, since I had to chisel on the stone tablets, but uh, still, eventually you're going to realize that you forgot more than more in the last year than you've learned. And so take that thing as soon as you can. 
Uh, for me, that's a big deal when uh, we're looking at applicants. The uh, It's not a requirement if you have a BS, what's it called here, Bachelor's in Engineering with Civil Emphasis. Yeah. Okay. With that degree, you're good to go without it. We'll still hire you without it. I would prefer you to have it. but. Uh, Eventually, you're going to get a stone wall if you don't have that test because then you can't take your professional engineer's exam. And that's going to greatly limit you. And, you know, you know how hard you guys are working now. And uh, that will really pay off eventually once you get your license. But uh, taking that uh, fundamentals of engineering exam is, is really the first step after college or toward the end of college that you definitely want to make sure you get that test. Um, grad school, decide whether you want to you know, go to work or go on and get your master's or your PhD. Kind of depends on what you want to do. You know, if you want to do research or you want to teach, then you got to have a PhD like Dr. Waite. Uh, master's degree uh, is probably a good thing if you want to do it and have the, the resources to do it. Now's the best time because five years from now when you're uh, encumbered with more expenses like a family, it'll be harder to go back and get that. So. Consider it strongly if you think you want to do it and, and you have the resources to do it. It helps a little bit pay-wise. It probably helps more in other places. Um, but for us, I think it's about a 10% increase. But consider that you give up two years of work. So how long does it take you to make up 10% of your pay um, by not working for two years and then also paying tuition for two more years? But I. I guess I would encourage you, if you want to do it, you should do it. And do you want to stay here in West Virginia or do you want to see the world? Uh, essential software skills. So you guys are probably way more computer savvy than I am. I bought my first computer uh, my junior year of college when I was 28. So uh, you guys have grown up with computers. We have a question on the uh, interview that we ask kids. Uh, you know, basically it says, computers have changed the world. What do you think of that? And they're like, what? There's always been computers, right? You know, so I know you guys are, are going to be up to speed on that. Resume, I was thinking about is paper resume. Do you still tell the, the students to have a paper resume? If they're ever printed anymore. Yeah, because they told us to buy fancy paper and all this and that. And now, even if, yeah, you don't print them anymore. You might email them to somebody, post them somewhere, but how many of you purposefully have a LinkedIn page or a, uh, a Facebook or a Twitter page or something that's, that's geared toward your professional life? Okay, some of you do. Okay, so that's what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm not on any of that stuff, but uh, I'm told that's a good way to get noticed. And, uh, you know, don't post stuff from your frat party on there. But... Uh, you know, employers are going to be looking for for uh, people everywhere they can find them, and so yeah, that's that's a technology change. Interview skills. How many of you have ever practiced your job interview? Okay, some of you have. That's a good thing. So I think that's an important thing to do, and and you're not sure. I mean, you can probably you know with ASCE or something, you can say, hey, you know, I got this job interview. Here, ask me the set of questions. And, you know, get one of your buddies to, to do it with you. Now, obviously, it's not the real thing. It's not the same thing. But uh, my youngest daughter's getting ready to go to graduate school. And uh, her probable future mother-in-law told her, you, know, you got to have the blue blazer, and you got to have the pad folio, and your hair's got to look like this, and you got to have this kind of what, not this kind of watch, but a certain kind of, you know, all these things. And we go to the grad school where she was looking at going, and it's like she's in uniform, you know, so. Uh, at highways, it's not quite so much, but uh, probably don't show up in a, in a fleece jacket and a pair of jeans with holes in them, but uh, we're not that picky, but uh, you know, look presentable. Look like you're coming to work. So, do you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Waite has my contact information. If you guys think of anything later, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me through him, and you can share uh, my email with him. Yes, sir? Yes, there is. 
and if you applied in by February, you'd be considered for that. Uh, right, yeah. Um, what's your name? Caleb. Caleb Mitchell. Okay, so they told me the names yesterday, and I believe you were among them. Uh, I'll check when I get back. Where did you, did you call up last year? You did not, okay. Did you put on there that you were interested in hydraulics, or was it like the, that wasn't a choice? Okay. Now I know why I'm getting left out, because <laughs> it's not one of the choices. Okay. I will check on that, and I will let Dr. Waite know, and if we can work with something, uh, and we'll do that. Okay. Anything else? Well, I appreciate you saying so. We do have lots of training opportunities. Uh, my two younger guys are going to uh, 2D, uh, SRH 2D next month in uh, Virginia to learn how to do 2D models. Uh, we figured out that water doesn't just flow straight down the river. Sometimes it goes around the bend and, and through the barn. So uh, there's that coming up. We always have a designers conference uh, in the fall, and there'll be specific classes that are very relevant we're going to teach. Our unit will teach a culvert class here coming up, uh, hopefully May time frame, and uh, we'll go to the uh, Mid-Atlantic Stream Restoration Conference in Baltimore in September. In the even years, we go to the National Hydraulics Engineers Conference. That was in Portland, Oregon last year. Columbia River is really nice. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot of opportunities for that. We, we, they are pretty liberal with our training budget and we try to make sure that that gets done. I know sometimes just with the busyness, and you'll find this anywhere you go, sometimes your boss is going to give you work and say, here, do this, and you're going to feel like he hasn't prepared you well enough to do it. So uh, I probably have done that once or twice. Oh, they're used to that by now. OK. Well, good. <laughs> you'll be ready then. Anything else? All right, thank you very much for having me. Let's eject your, uh, your USB also. All right. I don't want to lose my flying picture. <laughs> so you're not doing the holiday? Oh, I still haven't decided. I'm just going to leave it up to the weather. Okay. If it's nice, maybe I will. Just kind of run along. Are you going to do it? You're doing the 25? I'm doing the 25. Yeah. The oh. trail's in good shape. You have to come out and run. Just, just come and run. Just oh. cool. Okay. All right. See you later. See you. Thanks again for coming in. All right. Uh, I just need to close the file on my computer and we'll be up and running. Um, I've put comments online for everybody. And um, in general, the most commonly, uh, the most common changes that I saw people needing to make was increasing the height of the reservoir. Because if you don't take it up to the upper limit of the acceptable range under static conditions, then that means that the pipe could be sized smaller than it is if it's at a lower elevation. So the higher you take it up on the hill, you'd like to take it as high as possible, except for that at night there's not going to be any flow. And so then that would increase the static condition above the 850 limit. So uh, I, I put specific comments on everybody's submissions there on MU Online. If you have any questions, and please let me know. All right, so uh, a couple of announcements. The assignment that you've got due on Tuesday of uh, the week after spring break, these are all questions that are related to weirs. And we're going to talk about weirs today. On exam two, you know, we had discussed whether or not there'd be a water gems question. And so the lukewarm response that that poll got in class last time, and I thought about it some more. I think we're not going to have a water gems question on that exam. It's just going to be strictly the material since the uh, exam one. So you don't need to bring a computer with you 
uh, for the exam on Tuesday the 28th. Any questions about those announcements or something else? All right, let's talk about phase three of the project, which is sizing the reservoir. You still have a little bit of time for that one, um, but it's relatively straightforward. I think you're going to find it far simpler than phase one and phase two was. The purpose of the reservoirs is partly to pressurize the network, and we've talked about how the location on the hill is determining the pressure in your network because with the location, the elevation is specified. So we want to have a minimum and maximum pressure within that range that was already specified. But uh, part of the reason why we have a reservoir, rather than a direct connection to the spring that the water is coming from, is that we have a constant flow rate from the spring and a variable flow rate in your city. Um, we've previously looked at this figure that shows on the design day there are going to be some pretty large peaks in demand. Uh, in the evening and through the afternoon the, the demand is rising, but then during the nighttime hours the demand is much lower. And so in a previous assignment I asked you to kind of digitize this curve for the design day and come up with an hour by hour representation of what it is over here on the left axis, the percent of the average day. And then there's a secondary column that you can make, which is the percent of the peak. And if you see that here, it looks like maybe around uh, 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. is the peak, you can express that as 100% of the maximum flow rate. Each one of you is previously in phase one identified what the peak flow rate is, the design condition that you're going to be uh, sizing the pipes for. But since that much flow doesn't come from the spring, you have to have a reservoir to make up the difference between the inflow and the outflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate very briefly how to size a reservoir. It'll probably only take about five or ten minutes to show you how to size a reservoir. So if that gives you an idea of uh, how long it's going to take you to do the phase three, hopefully that you'll, you'll feel like that's a, a nice change based on how much you've, time you've spent on things till now. Um, let's say that we have a situation where the demand for a city is described by this curve. And what we know is that in that city, this example, that our peak demand is going to be 400 liters per second. And um, there's an average daily flow in this example of 257 uh, 253.7. So we want to find out how large does the tank need to be so that over the course of a 24-hour period, you have enough water to make up the difference between the demand, which is flow out of the tank, and the flow in. So if I was going to draw a little sketch of what's happening, we've got a reservoir and the outflow to the reservoir is going to the city and the inflow there's a T in city the inflow from the reservoir is coming from a spring alright and the uh, the flow from the spring is constant and the uh, outflow is variable and so what that means is that the water level in the tank is going to be fluctuating. It's going to be going up and down through that daily cycle. And we want to know how big does the tank need to be to hold that entire fluctuation through the daily cycle. So here's the basic procedure that I'm going to demonstrate. First of all, we're going to uh, look at when is the flow rate in greater than the flow rate out during the night. So in other words, when is the reservoir just barely starting to fill up? Because we want to find out how large does the tank need to be to hold all of the accumulation. If we go back to this figure, what this blue line is showing is the flow rate in to the reservoir. And um, in the case of your project, what you should assume the inflow from the spring to be, it should be the average of your daily demand. That way, if you fix it at that, there will be balance between the inflow and the outflow. So the inflow is constant, the outflow is variable. 
So that first step where I was saying, find when is it at night that you start filling the tank. It's right here on this graph. You can see where the curved uh, maximum demand line goes above the blue one. The tank is filling during these hours. So the tank is filling at, in this case, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is where when we're above the line, the demand is higher than the inflow. So the tank is draining in these phases, but it's at 11 o'clock that now the tank is starting to fill because at 11 o'clock, the inflow to the tank is higher than the outflow. I'm going to copy this table and paste it into Excel just to demonstrate the procedure. So I did Control C. I'll start up Excel. You have a similar thing to this. You don't have to use my numbers. You can use the numbers that you generated in the previous assignment where I asked you to uh, digitize that curve. All right, so here's some data. And um, with this, I'm going to insert a couple of extra columns. All right, so there is a flow rate in, in liters per second. And in our example that we're taking a look at here, it says, assume that you've got an inflow of 253.7 liters per day, uh, liters per second. Okay, so uh, 253.7, and that flow rate into the tank is constant throughout the day. And so I'm just going to drag that down. So there's always the same flow rate in. Now, with that, what we can calculate is the volume that comes in during every hour. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap my text here. All right, so we'll have this next column be volume in during the hour. And it's going to be in cubic meters that I'd like to know that. So how do I go from the flow rate of liters per second into the volume into the tank during the preceding hour? Okay, so if we divide by 1,000, that'll take it from liters to cubic meters, right? And then what's the other step? Good. Multiply by time. And so we need to know how many seconds per hour. So if I say this flow rate in times 3,600, now I know how many uh, liters came in during the 12 o'clock hour, because this is the flow rate, and there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. And then if I divide by 1,000, then that converts from liters into cubic meters. So the answer is 740 AM <laughs> cubic meters. All right, no. It's 913.3 uh, cubic meters during that hour. And so it's going to be the same. The same number of cubic meters come in every hour. All right, now this is where I start using this information, because this is explaining the outflow. Now, my, uh, my maximum outflow in the problem statement, in the, uh, in the city, it says that the, my maximum demand during the day is 400 liters per second. Okay, so uh, what I want is I want my, uh, my flow rate out during the high point of the day to be that 400 liters per second. So here is going to be my flow rate out in terms of liters per second. And all I do is I use this percent of peak and the max demand that was previously specified. So it's the peak times the maximum demand. And then if I drag this down, we'll see that sure enough, here at the 7 and 8, it's the peak demand. And there's some sort of an issue here. Ah, oh, it's because this isn't as percent. OK, that's more like it. All right, now that makes me nervous that it didn't, because that's an error I fixed earlier. 132, 152, all right, I think it's going to be fine. Okay, so um, this is the flow rate out, and then we can do the volume out during the hour. And we want cubic meters again, and so it's going to be the same kind of thing. It's the flow rate out times 3,600 seconds divided by 1,000 to get it from liters into cubic meters. So now we know the volume out for every hour. Now, one of the steps that's in here, it says to uh, find the time at night when the flow in is more than the flow out. So if we look 
uh, at midnight, the flow in is more than the flow out, but that's not the first time in the evening where that's happening. So let's look earlier. Like at 9 o'clock, uh, flow in is less than flow out. And so the tank would be emptying at 9 o'clock, and it's still emptying at 10 o'clock. But now at 11, the flow, let me zoom out a bit more. At 11, the, uh, the flow in is more than the flow out. So what that means is that starting in the 11 o'clock hour, the reservoir is going to start filling. So the reason why it matters is I need to make room at the top of my spreadsheet so that I can copy and move that data from the bottom to the top. And you'll see why in just a moment. So I've moved that to the top. So now at the front of my list, it's still in sequential order, but I have in the evening the first time that the tank starts to fill at the top of my list because the last column is going to be what I'm going to call DSDT, which is the change in storage during the hour. So during the 11 o'clock hour, if I have in minus out, you can see there was 178 cubic meters that accumulated during that hour. All right? And uh, let's see. Yeah, everything's still on track. So now I can drag this down. And for every hour, you can see that the tank is either accumulating volume or losing volume. And so I want to have the cumulative storage. So I'm going to call this column the accumulated storage volume. And it's in cubic meters. And so this is just going to be uh, in the first hour, we're assuming that the tank is empty to begin with. So it was at zero before the 11 o'clock hour happened. But now at the end of the 11 o'clock hour, it has accumulated 178.92 cubic meters. Um, at the end of the next hour, it's going to have the amount that was in there before plus whatever came in just during this hour. And so now it has a total of 573 cubic meters. All right. So now I can just drag that formula down because it's always going to be looking at the cell above it, which was the previous hour's total amount, and then the change for this hour. And if everything works out correctly, what I should expect is that at the end of my daily cycle, the tank is drained to zero volume, or fairly close to it. There will be a little bit of round off error here but I want it to balance out to zero at the end of the day. So here I'm going to drag that formula down. Hmm. Got pretty close, not exactly. Uh, should be a bit closer than that, in fact. So it's making me wonder, where is the difference? There's this persistent error that gets me every semester because this table here may be slightly different than what I have in my notes. Let me just take a quick look at that. 110, 132, 150. No, it's, it's fine. Um, the uh, sizing of the tank depends on the largest one that you get to. Um, so you know how big to build the tank by finding what is the largest one of these volumes. And so I could use the function equals max and then scroll down through all of these data points. And then this identifies the maximum volume of water that's in the tank during the day. And then this is how big to build the tank. So it's the required storage volume. But as for why it didn't go down to zero, I'm going to have to debug this later and get back to you because the, uh, the mistake isn't jumping out at me right now. Uh, 253.7 is our inflow. The volumes are right. High scale. 51.36. All right, well, we don't have all day for me to uh, find the mistake on this, but that's the basic procedure. I'll send you an email when I do find out what the issue was with why it didn't go to zero because that's one of the key indicators you should be looking for when you're doing your own spreadsheet is you know that you've done the procedure correctly if at the end of the daily cycle 
uh, the inflows and the outflows are in balance. So are there any questions about the basic procedure of how to do the reservoir sizing? Yes. Yeah, that's why you need it to, to go down to zero. It's like what this is saying, well, the, the example that I'm looking at that I, I calculated earlier, uh, reservoir sizing, was uh, it balanced down to 0.9 is, is what I'm looking for. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's essentially very, very close. So, in your case, what you're going to have is a max flow that you know based on demand estimation. Um, what may be a little confusing for some of you is to know, so based on that max flow rate, which is, you know, it's coming out, what to select for your flow rate in from the reservoir. And in the handout, the project description, I tell you that the flow in should just simply be the average of the daily flow out. So you know the flow out, and you've digitized this peak, and so you know the flow rate out at all the different times of the day, right? All you need to do is take your various flow rates out and calculate the average of that. And so the average of your outflows is what you should set as your inflow rate. And that's how you ensure that you've got balance during the day. I mean, in reality, you'd have some valve at the uh, spring, and so you'd control the flow rate into the tank with a valve. And so if people are using less water, then you'd close the valve a little bit, and you wouldn't draw so much from that source. But just because everyone has a different uh, flow demand, everyone in the class has a different estimate on the flow demand, uh, I just wanted to say that your flow rate in is going to be that average daily flow for your design day. Are there other questions? Yes. You use this graph, and you previously did this part of, of the converting this graph into numbers. So yes, you use that. You simply need to multiply this percent of peak by your <coughs> maximum daily flow. And then that gives you the, fl the flow rate out for every hour. Any other questions? All right. Let's talk about um, spillways. Um, we've already talked about spillways a little bit this semester. Normally, I don't, because normally there isn't a big prominent spillway failure in the news. But we talked about the Orville Dam and the spillway issues that they're having. The last I heard, the last headline I saw of the Orville Dam was that they uh, finally had little enough rain that they could switch off flow to the spillway for a while and try and make some repairs. And so they actually uh, stopped all of the flow coming out of the reservoir. And the water levels were falling down, down, down in the, uh, in the river downstream. But actually, they drained it so much that now the banks were collapsing. Um, and so, you know, coupled with the erosion that already has happened because of high flow, the water that was pushing against the banks and holding them stable, when the water level went down, a lot of the, the banks no longer had the pressure of the water holding the banks up. And so farmers have lost, in some cases, 30, 40 feet of land just due to it collapsing into the river. So then all of that mass of sediment is going to be washed downstream and be deposited in the estuary downstream. And so just like the, uh, <laughs> the disaster continues in California, unfortunately. Um, so here's a look at a spillway, a pretty famous one on the Columbia River. Let me dim the lights so we can take in the majesty of the uh, Grand Coulee Dam. It generates an enormous amount of uh, hydroelectric power. And uh, here's a look at the spillway as the, uh, the water is actually flowing over the face of it. As you might expect, it picks up a lot of kinetic energy as it drops at such a high elevation. And so the velocity of the water is very high when it reaches the bottom of a spillway. And so you have supercritical conditions at the toe of a spillway. 
And usually the water is then going into a, a channel that has a subcritical slope. And so you have supercritical flow going to subcritical flow, and the water jumps through a hydraulic jump. And we're working up to our calculations on hydraulic jumps in just a few class periods. But today, um, what we're going to be focusing on is uh, calculating the relationship between flow rate, the water level, and the length of the spillway. Here, not seen, because this is a cross-sectional view, is the term L, the length of the spillway. And if we go back here, the length of the spillway is the physical length of where the water is flowing over the surface. Now, in this case, it's showing that an overflow spillway kind of behaves, it can be simulated as a sharp crested weir. And so it's actually a concrete structure with this curved surface, but you can model the flow characteristics of water going over that curved surface as though it's water encountering a sharp crested weir. Um, so a couple of terms here. H is referred to as the height of the water above that hypothetical sharp crested weir up to the water surface. And if you break up H into two components, there's H sub D, which is actually the, uh, the physical height of the water above the spillway crest, and then this other component that, um, uh, where the curvature begins is where the, this Z elevation stops. And so this 0.11H, it's typically um, about 11% of the height is what they use to have that curved surface from where it's a flat face until the spillway crest. But you can, uh, there's an empirical relationship here that describes the, uh, the flow rate over the spillway as a function of uh, the height of the water level above the spillway crest, H sub D, and then the length of the spillway. And so if you need to get more flow rate across a, a spillway, then you simply have to make it longer. And uh, you don't have any problems on your homework assignment that uh, requires you to use the spillway equation. And so just so you get some exposure to it, you may get more exposure on the FE exam, but just to get uh, a chance to try out the spillway equation, let's use this example. Um, let's assume that we have a 300 foot long spillway. And this is on a reservoir where we have a maximum allowable water elevation upstream of the reservoir. What you'll notice is that the higher we make this spillway, then the higher the water level is going to be. And you know, why would we want a, a tall spillway? Well, you're storing water that can be used for agriculture. The higher the water level, then that increases the amount of yield that you have in terms of electricity generation due to hydropower. And so the people who want the dam there in the first place are going to want there to be this towering wall of water because that's the whole point of the reservoir in the first place is to have water storage, but there are going to be people who are displaced whenever a reservoir is built and people who are close to being displaced but maybe not quite submerged all the way. So in this illustration what we're saying is there are some existing structures upstream that limit the water level to an elevation of 4350 and so what we're trying to figure out is if we want the water level to be at 4350 then what elevation should the spillway crest be at? And uh, the elevation of that spillway crest is going to be governed by the flow rate, the length, and the H sub D parameter. So let me pause the recording and give you a few moments to uh, crunch the numbers at this, and then we'll look at the solution. All right. So here's what we're doing, just simply rearranging the equation to solve for H sub D because that's the uh, elevation difference between the water surface and the uh, spillway crest. So putting in the flow rate that's given, uh, the 3.97 units factor, the length of the spillway, taking it to the two-thirds power. So it should be 10.06 feet, so then that tells you you have to go lower than that for the spillway crest. So it's the 4350 minus H sub D tells you what elevation to put the crest at. All right. Now, the bulk of what we're going to talk about today are weirs. And this is a picture of a broad crested weir 
in a flume, similar to the flume that we've got in the hydraulics lab. And what you'll notice is that in this case, the water depth is decreasing as the water is going over this broad crested weir. And it's because there's, there's drawdown as you approach the edge uh, of, of the weir because the depth downstream is less than the depth upstream. Um, the water is subcritical as it approaches the broad crested weir, but then the depth is decreasing, the velocity is increasing, and it goes through a critical depth over the weir. Um, now the whole purpose of a broad crested weir is it can be used as a flow measurement device. Um, you'll notice a couple of dimensions here. First of all, when we're going through the equations for a broad crested weir, we're going to measure the uh, specific energy starting from the, the elevation of the weir up to the energy grade line. And so here H is what we've previously been thinking of as the, the energy. And so it's the depth and the velocity head combined. And so you'll see those two components here. H1 is the depth at some location and then there's the velocity head at some location. And here Previously, we've been talking about a delta Z is the step of some obstruction. Well, if we're using that obstruction as a way of measuring the flow, then suddenly it goes from being called an obstruction to a weir when you're doing it intentionally. So the way that they work is they induce critical flow over the, uh, the top of the weir. And if you measure the critical flow depth, then you can find out what the flow rate is. Unfortunately, the disadvantage of using a weir like this is that, number one, you have some energy losses in the system because you've put in an obstruction. But then also, um, these uh, steps can sometimes accumulate sediment and trash, and so uh, it, it's just an obstruction in the channel that things can get hung up on, like tree branches or sediment. Uh, so here is the, uh, the equation that you can use to quantify the flow rate over a broad crested weir. And um, there's a dis discharge coefficient, C sub D, that depends on um, how much energy is lost. And you, know, you can estimate that energy loss as a ratio of the elevation of the, um, the depth and the velocity head, so H, relative to the, uh, the height of the obstruction. Um, a pretty typical C sub D value is in the neighborhood of you know, 0.6 or so, 0.65, um, depending on how big the step is. But the, the, the way that this is a useful measurement device is just that if we know that the critical depth represents uh, two-thirds of the specific energy, then we can measure the depth over the broad crested weir and then that tells us not only the flow depth, but also it tells us the velocity head. And so we can say that H is three halves of the depth and then put that into this equation. So um, it's pretty useful equation. Uh, broad crested weirs allow us to measure the flow rate. Um, sharp crested weirs are similar, that they can be used for quantifying the flow rate, but rather than having a long um, surface that the water is in contact with and where the flow is becoming uh, the critical depth, the sharp crested weir has the water drawing down as it flows over some edge. And the way to understand a sharp crested weir is to compare the energy at two locations. And so here at location one, you can see if we're measuring the energy as being um, above the, uh, the weir edge, if we set that as our datum, then at location one, there is both depth and velocity head. And then at location two, since we're choosing this location to coincide with where it's the same elevation as the datum, then it's just only got elevation. And so, I'm sorry, it only has velocity because it's at the same elevation as the datum. And so the energy basically um, transfers from having both elevation and velocity into an increase in velocity. So if we use that energy equation and we say that the depth of flow at 2 is 0, then rearrange to solve for V2, this is the equation that we get to solve for the velocity at location 2. It's based on the depth and the previous velocity at 1. And 
if we just say by definition, if we say h, which is the distance from the edge of the weir up to the total energy line, is the depth and the velocity head, then we have the square root of 2gh. And where have you seen this formula before, the square root of 2gh? That's right, it's the orifice equation. And so now here it's resurfacing as a way of characterizing the velocity of a uh, sharp crested weir. Now the difference was that when you used it in the orifice equation, you were measuring from the physical water surface down to the center of an opening in, an orif in uh, some sort of a tank. That was the, the H that you were talking about in the orifice equation. Here, H isn't just the physical surface of the water height, but it also includes whatever additional elevation exists as the velocity head. So it makes things a slightly more complicated. But uh, there are a couple of different kinds of weirs that I need to tell you about because you have both in the homework assignment. And one is called a suppressed weir. And a suppressed weir is when it extends the full width of the channel. So a channel, for instance, uh, here was a picture of a channel. It's clear. It's got like acrylic plastic on both sides and the water flows down that channel. This plastic broad crested weir was going extending the entire width of the channel. And so when the, uh, when the water is flowing over an object that's the entire width of the channel, that's what we're calling a suppressed weir. And the reason it gets that word suppressed is that actually a, uh, a little bit of low pressure sets in here on the underside of what's called the nap. The water that flows over the edge is the nap. And so in here is uh, a little bit of suction pressure that uh, it, it brings some water up underneath the nap and it pulls the head of the nap down a little bit more. And so we have to treat it differently when it's the full width because of that suppression effect. So the formula for a suppressed weir, uh, we can go through the derivation, but because we're real short on time, the bottom line is that you have some coefficient of discharge that relates to energy loss. And then it's 2 thirds the square root of 2g, the length of it, and then the height of the water surface to the three halves. And the height here that we're talking about is the physical height of the water level down to the sharp edge, uh, to, to the location of the sharp edge. Um, now, if you have a, uh, a lot of water going over these, the limit that this equation works at is where you have an h to z ratio of about 2. So that means you can have twice as much height going over the weir, and this equation will still work. It's, it's better if, if the uh, height of the water is only about 40% of the weir height. But if you have it even beyond that, if you have the ratio down to 10% or less, then the C sub D basically settles into a constant 0.62 in that case. And so let's say that we substitute in this C sub D of 0.62 into this equation, and then the 2 thirds and also the square root of 2g. So if you combine all of those constants together, then you have just an overarching C value, where in BG units it's 0.33 and in SI units it's 1.84. Uh, so this 0.332 is, is where you put the C sub D, the 2 thirds, and the square root of 2g all together into one factor. And then at that point, you can use this equation for a sharp crested weir that's the whole width of the channel to know what's the flow rate based on the height of the water above the weir and the length, which means the width of the channel. So here L is talking about the width, the length of the weir. And you can see from this diagram, the length of the weir is going to be the width of the channel if it's suppressed. Questions so far? Mm -hmm. It's the, the nap is not free in a suppressed weir. But the nap is free if you have a contracted weir, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Like if air, if it's vented, if air can get down underneath the weir, like if there's a vent, then it's unsuppressed. Um, so here's an example it, that we're looking at the front view of this unsuppressed weir. The water's still going to be flowing over the edge, 
but it's, there isn't going to be the suction effect underneath the nap in this case. And so we make a correction based on the previous equation that we we're doing. We have to have a, a corrected equation that um, partly is due to flow contraction. You know, as the water is approaching, there is a little bit of an ineffective area um, because of the approaching streamlines. And uh, so you, you calculate that L prime that you put into the Weir equation. It's just an adjusted Weir length. And uh, you have to take out 20% of the height uh, in the case of an unsuppressed sharp-crested Weir. All right. So um, that's all we've got for today. I'm not going to see you again for about 11 days, not that anybody's counting, but uh, when we do get back together, we're going to have uh, exam two, and you're going to have this assignment. So I'll be in touch via email if you need to uh, send me a message, and if you have any questions about the comments that I wrote, or if you want to uh, pick my brain on the project, then I'd be happy to see you for that as well. Otherwise, have a great spring break, and uh, I'll see you afterwards.